Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 25. You see in your session notes we have two passages. I'm going to read them both to start with because we're going to cover them both all together. Matthew chapter 6 starting in verse 25. Jesus is speaking. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can uh, add a single hour to his span of life? And who and why, sorry, are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore don't be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Jump down to chapter 7, verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which of you, if his son asks for a bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good gifts or good things to those who ask him? Let's pray together. Father, as we dive into these two passages that are very familiar to a lot of us here in this room, uh, I thank you for the fact that you want to take us deeper today. You You want to take us into the much more parts of these passages So, Lord, in order for us to get deeper, uh, that can't be coming from Jim Johnson. Uh, If there's going to be spiritual truth understood, it comes from your spirit and from your word. But, Lord, your word says that you give insight and knowledge and understanding, not to the ones who are the smart ones in the room who can figure it out, but to those who come like children, who humbly say, I need understanding. I need your help. I need you to explain it, but I want it. You have what I need. And so today, Father, we come to you and we say, Daddy, Please open our eyes. Take us to, uh, to the depth of what you want us to understand today about our relationship with you and how good you are and how gracious you are to us. And Father, I also come with that same attitude saying, take control of my mind and my heart and my mouth as you use me in this time to communicate these truths. May people be hearing from you in your power. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, If you've been following Christ for any length of time, these are very familiar passages. You probably know them pretty well. But what we're going to do today is not really break the passages down in the whole of what they're talking about, about not worrying and those types of things per se, as much as we're going to just dive into the much more parts of these passages. Because that's one thing I thought about as I was looking at these passages and looking around through the scriptures at the much more passages. I came to these and I thought, well, these are passages we know pretty well. But then it hit me. As well as I know these passages, or as good as I know these passages, I've never really dove into the much more part. We've looked at don't worry and all this stuff, but how much have we actually meditated on the much more? And so that's what we're going to do today in these passages, pull out the much more aspects of it. And as we do, we're going to find something very interesting. Jesus says he's teaching, and by the way, you notice it's Jesus using the much more now? It isn't just Paul or whoever the Hebrew writer is. Who, who, who wrote the books of Paul? Jesus. Jesus. Very good. The Holy Spirit. Who wrote the book, the book of Hebrews? Jesus did. By the way, you can seem real smart when you, people try to argue over who wrote the book of Hebrews. You can say, I, I know who, does, who did. Jesus. <clears throat> God wrote it. It's God breathed. And he wrote the book of Hebrews. And here we see Jesus use those exact same type of phrases, the much more. But in doing so, he's bringing something out that I don't know how many of you have actually looked at or caught. Look at verse 26. Matthew chapter 6, verse 26. He says, Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your what? Your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you of not of more value than they? We'll come back to that more value in a second. But I want you to see that he points out the fact that he's our heavenly Father. Look again at verse 32. He does it again. 
In verse 32, he says this, For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. So once again, he points out that he's our heavenly Father. Jump down to chapter 7, look at verse 11. He does it again. In verse 11, he says, uh, he says, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So Jesus doesn't just say, won't I or God. He says, your Father. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. It's your Father. And I want you to let that sink in as we meditate on this much more aspect of these passages that are familiar to us. Jesus goes out of his way to say, your heavenly Father, he's, he cares for you. So if you do a little study then on what it means to have him as a father, go with me to Psalm 103. You'll start to see that with his role as father, there are some things that are expected of him in our relationship with him. Go to Psalm 103 and look at verses 8 and following. Psalm 103, starting in verse 8, says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. Now, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. So here we see all this. By the way, you want to take a passage to meditate on? Just take those verses and just break them down one at a time and, and let the Spirit of God speak to you as you meditate on those verses. There's so many cool things about his love for us there. But as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Jump over to Galatians chapter 4. Look at verses 1 through 7. Paul's talking about some deep theology here, and he says, I mean that the heir, chapter 4 of Galatians, verse 1, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he's the owner of everything, but he's under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so that you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So again, the Bible talks about this relationship that we have with him. The Bible says in John chapter one, to all who received him, he gave them the rights to become children of God. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he says, you must be born again. Folks, when you by faith receive Jesus as your savior, you were born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you who are guarded by faith until this coming salvation. You became a child of God and he became your father. And as a father has compassion for his children, so much more does the heavenly father have compassion for you. Here again, it says that we have been made his children. And by the way, did you catch what it says though here? Go back at verse uh, chapter four, look at verse uh, six. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So who's actually crying out, Abba, Father? Is it you or is it the Holy Spirit? It's the Holy Spirit. Actually, if you go to 2 Thessalonians, don't do it now. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5, Paul says this, May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and the perseverance of Christ. Folks, understand this relationship that you and I have with him is a deep relationship. But it's not just that he's our father and we've got to be good and obey our father. It's actually he's the one who gives us the grace and the ability to love him in return. It's his own spirit that comes in our hearts. And when you cry out, Abba, Father, and you call him Daddy, it's because the spirit of God is doing that work in you. It's not up to you. Oh, and let me show you something else that's kind of jumped out at me. It's not in your uh, note pages of scriptures. I'm going to jump off of the note pages of scriptures. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Look at verse 8. 
as I was kind of praying over this passage for this morning, God brought something to my mind. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, look at verse 8. It says, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Here are instructions to the church, and there was a problem back then of people being busybodies and being lazy, and because the teaching was that they'd be ready for the return of Jesus, and Paul expected it in his lifetime. That's why in 1 Corinthians 15 he says, and we who are alive are going to be caught up. He thought the rapture was going to happen in his lifetime, and the church was taught that, and we should be always looking for it. But because of that teaching, there were those who decided, well, I don't have to go to work. How many times have I heard Christians today say, well, if the rapture is going to come, I'm just going to run up a whole lot of debts on my credit card. And when the rapture comes, I'll let Satan pay those bills. And that attitude was at the church in the early days. And there were people that had actually stopped, being, stopped working and they were lazy. And God, through Paul, says to them, if you're not going to work, you can't eat. And not only that, if you don't provide, if you expect the church to take care of your family, that person should be treated as an unbeliever. So if God expects us to provide for our household, what does that say about God? He's going to provide for his. He can't say to us, I expect you to provide for your household and not ex take care of us as well. If he's saying to us, I'm your father, I'm your father, I'm your father, he's showing us he really, really cares for us. Go back to Psalm, look at 30, chapter 37, verse 25. In Psalm 37, verse 25, David writes this, and he says, I've been young and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. Isn't that interesting? He says, I'm young, I was young, now I'm old, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. Now we've got to go somewhere real quick. Isn't this the same David that went and asked for the bread? of the presents, the shield bread, when he and his men were hungry? Well, didn't he beg for bread then? Wait a minute, didn't we read earlier in Deuteronomy that God said in chapter 8, I'm the one that led you into the wilderness where there was no food and no water, and I made you hungry, and I made you thirsty? Don't take this passage to say that you'll never go through a time where you're wanting Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, he said, I've learned the secret of being content. I know what it is to have plenty. I know what it is to be in need. But I've learned the secret of all things, of being content. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Folks, listen closely to what the passage, as you put the whole of Scripture together, to teach, is teaching us. That if you're his child, he will always provide for you. There will be times that he will intentionally make things get a little thin. But when he does that, he's doing it to get your attention and to put your eyes back on him. He is your provision. He, Paul, when David says, I've never seen his children begging for bread, he's saying, I've never seen his children have to, be, have to be out there taking care of themselves. Even though he may put you through a time period where things are a little tight, where you don't know what to do, because that's part of his plan of shaping and disciplining. We looked at that last session. He's a loving father, and he'll never leave you to take care of it on your own. He wants you to come to who? Him. Your daddy. You're going to see that in just a little bit. But there's something else. Go back to Matthew chapter 6. There's something else he brings out that I think we need to look at, especially in this day and age we live in. He points out the fact that he uses comparison between us and the animals. Look again at verse 26. He says, Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And then look at verse 28. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? He brings out the fact that he compares us to how he takes care of the grass and the earth and he takes care of the animals. But he brings out a very interesting point. He said, aren't you of more value than the animals? By the way, did you catch that in the day and age in which we live today? You know, the world today is teaching that we're of equal 
at best, value with the animals. Sometimes the animals are more valuable than us. Sometimes the earth is more important than us. Isn't that what the world's teaching? You know, so, you know you've got to protect the baby hoot owls, but we can abort babies. The world is teaching that man is of not more value, that the animals have just as much rights as us, and that's not what the Bible teaches. God himself says that we're of more value than the animals. So I'm going to talk to you about a couple of things that are going to sound a little political this morning, but I'm not going political. I'm just going to go biblical. All right? Amen. And so stick with me here, though, because you need to build your theology and your worldview according to the scriptures. The scripture says you're of more value than the animals. And I'm going to show you from scripture there's a difference between us and the animals. The Bible says there is, and there should be. Go to Psalm 32. Look at Psalm 32, verses 8 and 9. God speaking, he says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with a bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Do you see the difference between us and the animals? By the way, I don't want to get into a whole disagreement with anybody, but I, I believe the Bible does teach that we have three parts. I'm a trichotomist, if you will. Those of you that get into those terms, there's dichotomists and trichotomists. I'm a trichotomist. The Bible actually talks that there's a body, soul, and a spirit. The animals have a body and a soul, but they have no spirit. The plant has a body, but no soul and no spirit. There's a difference between plants and animals, and there's a difference between animals and human beings, and you need to understand you're of more value than the animals. And that's why he said, God says, I'm going to counsel you and guide you. I'm going to lead you. I'm going to put my spirit within you, and I'm going to teach you to follow me. I, I can't do that with the animals. You've got to put a bit in their mouth to get them to follow you, or else they won't follow. Go to Psalm 73. The psalmist Asaph said something very interesting. In Psalm 73, look at verses 21 and 22. He was sharing his frustration with God because there was a period in his life where he thought that it, what good does it do me to, to follow God and obey his word? Because all the people that are wicked there seem to be rich and fat and happy and I'm struggling. And then he says in verse 21, when my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Folks, the animals cannot connect with God like you and I can. We have the ability because we've been given a spirit and we're able to receive his spirit. We actually are more value than the animals. Well, by the way, do you know that the Bible talks and commanded animal sacrifices? And did you know that the Bible very, very strictly forbade human sacrifices? Why? Because we're of more value than the animals. We're of much more value than the, anim than the animals. Don't, don't, don't miss that. Well, like I say, we live in a day today in which people are committing suicide because they've been taught from childhood in the schools that they're an accident and it just so happened that they showed up here and there's no plan and they're of no more value than anybody else and no, everybody's equal and everybody, the animals are equal with you or even maybe more so, more value. And we wonder why kids are killing themselves today. They need to understand the scripture. Jesus himself said, I'm your father and you're of more value than the animals. I care about the animals, though. He said, did you catch that? He says, no, like, I don't, not like I don't care about the animals. I take care of them. Every time I see a bird out there just kind of looking for food, I'm reminded, God's taking care of that bird. He's got me, too. He's got me, too. Uh, while I'm on this little topic about how the world today is trying to teach you that you're of less value than the animals, I'm going to chase a rabbit real quick. Now, for those of you that know me, I've taught people that I've been teaching for over the years not to chase rabbits. Beware of preachers who chase rabbits. But if you're going to chase them, make sure it's one you can catch. And if you catch it, it's going to taste good. I'm going to chase a rabbit. We can catch this rabbit, and it's going to taste good. It's going to be helpful for you as well. I want to talk to you about this whole climate change, global warming mess that's going on at the same time. We're going to let the scripture speak to it. All right? Go with me to Job chapter 38. Because this is all tied to what I just talked about with us being uh, more valuable than the animals, even though the world says we're not of more value than the animals. The world today is saying that man has 
affected the climate on the earth and that man has con controlled things to the point that the earth is overheating and the seas are going to overflow and we're going to lose Florida or parts of California and islands are going to disappear because there's global warming and all this stuff. And I'm going to show you from scripture that the Bible says and God himself says man has no control over the weather. In Job 38, and if I'll turn to Job 38 instead of Psalm 38, I can read with you. Job 38, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, and he said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? He tells him, he says, Dress for action like a man, and I'll question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding, Job. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched out? the line upon it, on what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars that the angels sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Look at what he says in the next verse. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb, when I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its waddling band and prescribed limits for the oceans and set bars and doors and said, thus far you shall come and no farther. And here shall your proud waves be stayed. Right now, who's controlling whether or not the oceans overflow us? God is, not man. Keep reading. Have you, look at verse 12. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked, their light is withheld and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you or have you seen the gates of the deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this, Job. Where is the way of, to the dwelling of light? And where is the place of darkness that you may take it to its territory, that you may discern the paths to its home? You know, for you were born then, and the number of your days is great. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow? Or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? What is the way to the place where the light is distributed or where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? Who has cleft a channel for the torrents of rain and a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on a land where no man is, to the desert where there is no man, to satisfy the waste and desolate land and to make the ground sprout with grass? Has the rain a father or who has begotten the drops of dew? For from whose womb did the ice come forth and who has given birth to the frost of heaven? The waters become hard like stone and the face of the deep is frozen. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth the Maseroth in their season? Or can you guide the bear with its children? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you establish the rare rule on the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who can number the clouds by wisdom? Or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens when dust runs into a mass and the clods, of stick, uh, clods stick fast together? Can you hunt the prey for lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their thicket? Who provides for the raven its prey when the, its young ones cry to God for help and wander about for lack of food? It's pretty clear through this passage, God saying, you got no control over the earth especially the weather I control all that now here's why I share this with you in this time of us being of more value than the animals isn't it interesting that the world today say that we have no more value than the animals yet when it comes to us having a chance to control the earth and the weather and put ourselves above God all of a sudden we're pretty powerful and important aren't we the only time the world today will give you value and importance is when you can be above God. Folks, build your theology and your worldview from the scriptures. We don't control the climate. We have no control over it, never did. God has control over all that. And he's got things set. Oh, by the way, the Bible does teach that global warming is coming. 
You read the book of Revelation, there's going to be a time period in the book of Revelation during the tribulation period where the sun's going to scorch people and they're just going to be, have no way to get away from it. Oh, global warming is coming, but it's not because of man's causing it, it's because of God's going to do it in his judgment. Even if the temperature changes a degree here or there, you're not controlling it. I'm not controlling it. God is. Oh, and even though he controls the whole earth and he cares for the animals and the, and the, and the grass, he says to us, I'm your father and you have more value to me than the earth Amen. and the animals. Well, that leads us to our next section. Go to chapter 7 of Matthew. He then says to us, because I'm your father and I care for you and I'll provide for you, ask me for stuff. Ask me, chapter 7, verse 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Now, this is the time of year that I love, and it also frustrates me a little bit. Christmas time's coming up, and our kids have for years, and even though they're 25, 23, and 21, they're still doing it. They're giving mom and dad Christmas lists. <laughs> we would like this, 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 and this. And I wish it was only this, 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 and this. But here's the deal. Actually, I'm glad to do it. Here's why. My heart is I want to give them everything on their list. If, if I financially could, I would. I love my kids. It's just an amazing thing. You know, just recently we uh, uh, took a trip and did a family weekend, and, and, and uh, my kids all came. And they said, we want to do this, and we want to do this, and we want to do this. And what they really were saying was, we want you to pay for this, and we want you to pay for this, and we want you to pay for this. <laughs> but listen, I was so glad to do it, I couldn't get my wallet out fast enough. The fact that my kids at the age of 25, 23, and 21 actually want to be with mom and dad that meant so much to me. I was like, let's do it. I'll pay for it. Let's go. Because my heart is for them. And if I, who am evil, know how to give good gifts to my children, folks, how much more? Amen. The Bible says we don't have because we don't ask. Please don't, don't hear me going down that road where you can be a millionaire and you'll never be sick. You've heard me teach. The Bible teaches that we are, God's going to put us through times of leanness and times of struggle and times of discipline to shape and to teach us and to mold us. But don't ever let that make you lose sight of the fact that he's for you and he's generous. He's a loving father. And if you want to give your kids everything on their list, how much more does God want to bless you? And you've got to keep in mind that he says to us, uh, sometimes you ask, but you ask with the wrong motives because your heart's all about what you want instead of what I want for you. But you also are missing out on a lot of stuff because you don't ask. Years ago, I had the chance to spend a day with Adrian Rogers three weeks before he died. We didn't know he was going to die three weeks later. But because of a, a, a friend that was my, a friend of mine and a friend of his, it was worked out that I was able to go spend a day with him. And I sat down with Adrian Rogers for about a half an hour or an hour during that time period. And, and I asked him what I asked most older pastors. I asked him if, that if you did it all over again, what would you do for, uh, what would you do differently? What would you change? And Adrian Rogers' answer was amazing. He said, Jim, I would have believed God for more. And I said, wait a minute, you're Adrian Rogers. I mean, God's done a lot of stuff through you. He goes, yeah, and I'm not talking money and I'm not talking buildings. He said, but I've come to realize at this late stage in my life, there's a lot more God wanted to do, but I didn't trust him and I didn't believe him. He said, I would have believed God for more. How much more? But many of us are spending our time. Remember how we said at the beginning of our series, the fact that there's so many passages that talk about much more must mean that Satan's out there trying to blind us to the truth of what's really available to us in Christ. Now, as we start working toward the close of our study for this morning, I need to actually take you to Luke's account of this passage because Luke brings out something in Jesus' teaching that will help us understand Jesus' teaching in Matthew a little bit more. Go to Luke chapter 11 and look at verses 9 through 13.
Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 9. And he says, I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a snake? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Matthew says good things. Luke brings out that Jesus said the Holy Spirit. Folks, as we kind of draw this session to a close, I, I'm going to just share some scriptures with you. But I want you to go meditate on them. See, I'm at a frustrating part right now because there's so much that I want to show you, but I can't. Because your relationship with the Father is going to be different than my relationship with the Father. We're all brothers and sisters through Christ. But just as those of you who have had more than one child know that even though you love them all, your relationship with each one is a little bit different your relationship with the Father and my relationship with the Father are going to be slightly different as well. And as much as I want to sit here and say to you, oh, there's this and there's that and there's this and there's that, there comes a point where I have to stop, try, stop talking and let the Holy Spirit speak because you're not going to move into the much more because Jim told you. You're going to move into the much more because you ask and you seek and you knock. Do you see what I'm saying? It's been designed by God not for me to go much further than I'm going today, but to point out to you that whoever asks receives, whoever seeks finds, whoever knocks, the door will be open to that person. And God has designed it not that you would say, Jim said you'd give me this. No, that you would go to him and he says, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Do you realize he's more, far more interested in your relationship with him than he is about all the stuff that he could give you? You see, that's why in our passage in Matthew, he says in chapter six, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, the relationship with him that will move into eternity through faith in Jesus Christ. Seek him and his kingdom and his righteousness, and then all this stuff will be taken care of. God is not interested. See, if my kids wanted me just to pay for stuff so they could go do it, I might not have been so quick to pull the wallet out. The reason I was quick to pull the wallet out is because they wanted to do it with me. Do you understand? Go to John chapter 14. Look at verses 15 through 20. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he'll give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. Man, I love that. I'm not going to give birth to you and then not be a father. I'm not going to be a baby daddy, as they say today. Do you ever notice that that's the new term? Because they don't want to say father, because that involves responsibility. So nowadays, when people give birth to a kid, they just say, that's, that's my baby daddy. That's sad, isn't it? Jesus says, no, no, no. When I give birth to you spiritually, through your faith in my son, you become my child I put my spirit within you and seal you as mine, and I'm never going to leave you as orphan. I'm going to come to you. I will come to you, and yet a little while the world will see me no more, but you're going to see me, and because I live, you also will live. And in that day, you'll know that I'm in my Father, and you're in me, and I'm in you. It's interesting. Jesus says in verse uh, 16, I'll ask the Father. He'll give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, and he's with you and he'll be in you. But then in verse 20, he says, in that day, you'll know that I'm in my Father and you're in me and I'm in you. So which is it? Is the Holy Spirit going to be in us or is Jesus going to be in us? Yes. yes. Man, you are swimming in God, folks. You're in the Father and he's in you and you're in him. And Man, you are his child and he cares for you 
And that's why Paul prayed the prayer that he prayed that I want you to see in closing today. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Paul's sitting in prison, and he prays this prayer for the believers. Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 13. He says, In him, in Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he's called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Listen closely to what Paul says. He says, when you trusted Christ as your Savior, he didn't leave you as an orphan. When he gave you new birth and you became born again, he sealed you with his spirit, which is a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. How many of you are old enough to remember layaway? Remember layaway? <laughs> layaway is when you would give him a hundred bucks and say, put my name on that couch, put it in the back. I'm coming back to get it, right? If you've been born again, you've been put on layaway. <laughs> God put his name on you. He put his spirit in you. He said, that one's mine. And when I come back, I'm going to get that one. I'm coming back to get him. He put you on layaway. And then he says, here's my prayer for you now that I've heard of your faith and your love for each other. Your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for each other. Here's my prayer. My prayer is that the spirit of God that's come, to within you, come within you will give you understanding and revelation. That the eyes of your heart would be opened. That you know the hope to which he's called you. His glorious inheritance that we have in, as being a saint. And his mighty power that's available for us who believe. Now, preachers want to try to explain to you what all that is. But Paul says, my prayer is that God will open your eyes to this truth. Do you see it? So I say to you, my brother and my sister, how God manifests is going to look different for each of us because our relationship with him is all slightly different. We're all come to him and be born again the same way through faith in Jesus Christ. We become children of our father the same way that children of the same parents get born but as their relationships are all slightly different, yours are all going to be slightly different. And the Father says, um, I've given you the Holy Spirit to walk you through this relationship with me. So it's now up to you to believe it and to ask and to seek and to knock. You ask, seek, and knock, you'll be born again. You'll be saved. You come to him in faith, you will believe. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But don't stop calling on the name of the Lord. Oh, there are going to be times when you say, Lord, I really want a Winnebago. And, and he's going to say, well, let's talk about that. Why do you want the Winnebago? You know, and there are going to be times he's going to say no to our requests. But don't lose sight of this. He's our loving father and he knows what's best. And when he says no, that actually is the right answer for us. And if you believe it, you'll know you'll be OK when he tells you no, because he's good and he loves you more than the animals. He loves you more than the earth. He's got all that taken care of, and even more does he have us taken care of. Would you pray with me as we get ready to sing a praising song in closing today on God's great faithfulness. Father, I thank you for this time to study your word. I thank you for how you've begun to open our eyes a little bit more to this much more parts of these passages we've looked at. And we've looked at not worrying and all these types of things and asking and seeking and knocking. But today you took us to the much more aspects of it. How much more do we have through the Holy Spirit because of our relationship with you that you want us to understand? But this is going to be a part of the journey of spending time with you on a daily basis, spending time in prayer, spending time in your word, believing what you've said. And like Adrian Rogers said, believing the much more, believing you for more. Lord, you'll keep us from taking it to unbiblical realms because you're a good father and you know how to take care of us in that way. But Lord, May we not sit back and just assume that we're going to struggle in this life and have no blessings at all. 
Your word talks about the fact that you're good and you're generous and you give us power and there's inheritance that's ours even now. Lord, take us to where that is and to keep us from trying to tell everybody else what that should look like and may we follow you in our individual relationships. Father, thank you for the much more promises of these passages we looked at this morning. We look forward to what you're going to show us this afternoon in our last session. In your name we pray this, Jesus. Amen.